Catholicism. No. So you're not, you're not like, you don't have anything especially against Roman Catholic theology. I have no beef with uh, Catholicism, no. I see. So what, what prevents you from converting? What is something are that... You especially, are you especially opposed to Catholic school girls? Okay, that's not, uh, <laughs> let's, let's not go. Thanks for the nice question, Jack. Okay, <laughs> always, always good to have you there. So, uh, either way, uh, Alex, what prevents you from being Roman Catholic? Because you know, I'm an okay, you don't know me, but the thing is, I'm an ex atheist, okay? And I used to be an atheist for about a year. I've, uh, I, I used to go into atheism, I used to. I used to talk with atheists, all activist atheists, and I saw the light. And I, I wasn't even raised Catholic. No, let me give you an example. There are some some people in my family who say that the coronavirus thing in Italy is because of the Pope. So my thing is, how come? What stops you from being Catholic? What prevents you? Because I, I, I've seen a couple of your videos, you know, with Matt Slick, with Darth. But what, what is it that really would prevent you from converting to Roman Catholicism? Um. I mean, I'd, I'd have to be persuaded. Something would have to make me think that it was true. I didn't see anything. So you have no, you have no way to say that it's not true. You're just saying it's a personal feeling that you. Wait a minute, wait. A minute. That was not an informative a answer, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, sorry. Let, let's. I'm, I'm going to take like two minutes because I, I know that there are so many people wanting to. I don't want to take all the time. I'm just asking. Do you admit? your personal feeling you're talking about like you're not all, all alex said was that there has to be a reason that i would no. convert to catholicism if i had a reason to convert to catholicism yeah which is just, sure of course it's just so if you're not if you're like <laughs> well it's true though but what the question was kind of like you know what prevents Apology you from believing in p true, a reason Apology to believe in p always <laughs> so do, do you agree do you agree that there are this is going to be going to go down this is already going downhill isn't it <laughs> no, but do, do you agree, Mr. Ma Let me give you the celebrity role so you're distinguished, right? So, mm -hmm. the, do, do you do you do you not see how someone can have personal views and be unconvinced of something, but that something still be true? Like, for example, yes. so many flat Earth. So, how do you know that's not what's occurring with you? Way do you have to say, okay, that's not occurring with me? I'm, I'm like, how do you know your beliefs or whatever persuades you is the truth? Because we have so much evidence for the earth being at least relatively round, but some people feel that that's not enough. We need something more. So, how can you decide that what needs convincing you is actually what is good evidence? Because I don't see the connection there. You might be unpersuaded, but it might still be good evidence. I mean, Catholicism oh. might be true. Yeah, I just, I don't see any reason to believe that it is. Okay. What is for, for which you think that uh, Roman Catholicism, well, Christianity isn't true. It doesn't even have to be Catholicism, right? Why do you think that Christian, what, what, what reason do you have to say that it's probably not true? That what's not true? Theism, Christianity, Catholicism? Yeah, Christ, Christ, Christianity. Well, Catholicism is Christian. So, so what reason would you have to say it's not true? Um, so can, it's a slightly different question. You asked me to begin with, um, what prevents me from believing that it's true? Um, and now you're asking me what reason I have for thinking that it's not true, right? Um, yeah, it's I like, think they're slightly different questions, but I mean, I guess, um, look, I don't, I've never seen anything that moved me from, um, my, background knowledge about the way that the world works i've never been persuaded to this is no, none of the evidence is overcome <laughs> fuck off jack <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're ex expecting like an argument which is like you know pq therefore you know christianity is false or something i mean i there's a whole ton to to choose from but it's that's not what has moved me. I've never been moved to not believe. I've just never believed. Nothing has changed my mind. Alex, um, to make how, me how believe you, Alex, how how is what you describe not pers uh, argument from personal incredulity? Like, the thing is, I understand. Oh my God! No, just, just, <laughs> the thing what I'm asking is, I understand you've never been, and I, I I respect that. But do you have any objective reason to think that you know what what persuades or doesn't persuade you? 
has anything to do with our reality? I don't understand the question. What? <laughs> so, so I'll try to make it simpler, right? So the thing is, you obviously hold some persuasions, right? You're not persuaded, and you're persuaded. Mm -hmm. How do you know that these persuasions have anything to do with reality? How, how do you know that what persuades you is actually good evidence? Maybe you are persuaded by bad evidence or you're persuaded by good evidence. Look, maybe there's some really good evidence for Catholicism or Christianity that I've not considered, right? And maybe that's right. I'm not saying, I'm not ruling that out. I'm just saying nothing. That, and I've, you know, I've looked at a whole bunch of philosophical arguments mainly for things like theism and Christianity, and none of them has ever seemed to me to be very convincing. Maybe there's some really good evidence out there. Maybe I, maybe you've got some really good evidence or something I don't have. So I'm, you, you seem to be thinking that uh, if I've got the view that, you know, if I don't have your view, that I need that I need to be able to like explain away all of the reasons you might have for being Christian. I don't know why you believe the things you do, and you might have good reasons, and there might be the sorts of reasons where if I knew about them, I'd believe as well. I don't know whether that's true or not. Right. All I'm saying is, from my point of view, the things I've considered, and to be honest, I've never really considered Catholicism, because you know I've got other things to think about. Not everyone's going to consider everything. Have you considered whether there were two shooters that killed JFK? Right. I mean, have you really gone into all of the evidence about that? No, have you not? Like some things you're just not going to think about. Right. So what? Like I haven't really thought about that. That. So you know, until I do, or until I'm persuaded. I don't believe that it's true, right? I'm not saying I know it's false, but I don't think it's true. But you've that's considered, it. That's my view. You've considered Catholic school girls. <laughs> We're going to start meeting. Okay, now people are asking me to, you know, move on because they don't like me, apparently. But I'm going to ask one final thing. I'm going to just let someone else take over. The thing is, do, do, do you admit that you are the your brain is the only one that's doing the evaluation of this evidence of that what persuades you, right? So here's the thing, right? You admitted that there isn't anything that's come along to change your mind. That's not anything rational, right? You just in your brain have some things that would persuade you and that hasn't happened. And, and that has nothing to do with reality. All it has to do is with your evaluation. So my question is, how do you even know you're evaluating evidence correctly? Is there some kind of consensus that you go to? I, I don't see any consensus saying that Catholicism is false. What do you default to? My personal feeling. And if so, how is your position better than what you believe mine is? Isn't that what you believe believers get wrong? They have like omens or you know, signs or miracles that persuade them. So how is yours more superior or more rational if that's the same thing, right? Um, first of all, I have no idea what your position is. I've never spoken to you before, right? So I'm, I'm not going to presume you're irrational. I don't think all theists are irrational. Um, depends what what you already believe, right? And what evidence you take yourself to have. So for, as far as I know, you could be perfectly rational, right? Um, so I, it feels like you just jumped to a lot of conclusions about what my view is. Um, and so because of that, I just, I'm not sure that it's worth addressing it directly. I mean, you just sort of you know, packed a lot into the question, which um, doesn't apply to me, I think, right? Like you assume, I think all Christians base their belief off some apparitions or like inner feelings or something. And some of them do, right? Some is stupid people of all varieties, not just Christians, right? Or not just theists. The stupid atheists, right? The stupid philosophers, the stupid English atheist philosophers called Alex, right? There's loads of there's loads of you know stupid people out there. I don't think all Christians are stupid, right? Some of them are, you know, some of them are extremely intelligent and way, way more so than me. So I don't think they're all irrational. Uh, so I just think you, you know, you've painted me with a, a brush that I don't, I don't accept. CC, do you think he's saying that Christianity is false because he's not persuaded it's true? No, I believe he's saying that uh, he has non-rational reasons for rejecting Christianity, which is his personal conviction. But, you know, I I, I don't want to hog up all the time as people tell me in voice chat. You know, who right. have to go next. Yeah. I think yeah. Kathleen had a question. Yeah, uh, am I coming through okay? 
because yeah. my my has been kind of. I said, like, Alex, we had a conversation a couple of months back. And this was uh, in the Tom Unboxes uh, server. Okay. Your debate with uh, William Lane Craig, who had been kind of going over with me uh, stuff about some set theory, and okay. I, I don't I don't have the recording, which sucks because I would have liked to have gone back and analyzed it. But there was a point in there where. Um, you had gotten me to uh, you had gotten me to the point where you were discussing this like idea of um, if there was uh, if if they are assuming a finite past and they should also be assuming a finite future. Uh, if there was an infinite past and there's no reason that there isn't an infinite future, and you kind of brought that up in the Craig debate, but mm -hmm. I felt like there wasn't enough time to explain that. So could you kind of just like go over that a little bit more in in depth because that's a position that i i found you know interesting at least okay so um that argument is um okay so that craig's obviously defends the kalam cosmological argument and uh he has two philosophical um supports for the premise which says that the universe began to exist right? like the second premise or whatever um, one of those is the Hilbert's Hotel argument, and the other one is the it's like a successive addition argument, right? So the the thing I was talking about with with Craig in particular was this criticism of that Hilbert's Hotel argument. It's, it's one of the two philosophical arguments that Craig gives for the second premise of the column. So it's quite a specific, narrow bit of the literature, and the debate the the idea is supposed to be like this. Craig says look, if the past had no beginning, right, then the number of events that would have taken place in the past um, would be infinite in number. Um, uh, but he says, now that, that would be weird, right? If there was um, something that was infinite in number that actually existed in the real world, then um, it would have bizarre properties. And one of the properties that he is trying to explain, the property in particular, is exemplified by Hilbert's Hotel, right? So this story, many people are familiar with this, so I'm not going to belabor it, but like, you know, imagine there's an infinite hotel, a hotel with infinitely many rooms in, and each one has a guest in it. And then somebody turns up to the hotel and says, can you spare me a room? And the, the manager's like, we're, we're full, but hold on a minute, gets everyone to shuffle up one room, frees up room number one, and makes room for the new guest, even though the, room, the hotel was full before. Right? In a finite hotel, you can't shuffle everyone up one room and make make a spare room available, but in an infinite hotel, you can, right? And it's got this weird property. So the property is basically just um, in, uh, if you have a set that has infinitely many things in it and you put a new thing in that set, you've still got the same number of things that, as you did beforehand, right? The cardinality or the, the amount of things um, doesn't change if you add uh, a single thing, if you add any finite number of things. Um, it's never going to increase. In fact, even if you added an infinite amount of things um, in the right way, then what you'll find is the cardinality of the set is the same afterwards. And and uh, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? But you know, when you're doing uh, arithmetic on infinite sets, transfinite arithmetic, then it's kind of weird, right? Anyway, so Craig builds. Uh, he he kind of says, well, look, you can think about Hilbert's Hotel and. In a certain sense, the mathematics can be consistent, but like nothing like that could really exist. Um, so he thinks, you know, the past, if there was infinitely many events in the past, and then like a new one happens, like you have a drink or whatever, then that is present now. But then as soon as you finished it, it's past, right? So it's one of the things that's in the past. And if you were to number all of the things that had been past and then renumbered them, now you've just had a drink, you'll find that there's the same amount even though you just added one to it, right? So that's just like the guest coming to the Hilbert's hotel and somehow being allowed in, and there's still just the same amount of guests left afterwards. Now, you might be able to tell from the way I'm talking about it, I don't find that particular, I mean, it's kind of weird, but it, you know, there's no contradiction straightforwardly from that. Um, mm -hmm. you, can, you, can make, you can make the case that it's contradictory, but what you have to do there is, um, so, there's a, so there's this property that's, um, sometimes called Euclid's maxim, which basically just says um, that the the whole is greater than the proper part. So if you've got a proper part of something like, 
you know my left ear or something it's it's smaller than the whole of my body taken um before but just yeah it's smaller than than the whole and the idea is that in any any physical thing that exists uh, if you take a proper part of it it's going to be smaller than than the whole of it but you know infinite sets you can take the proper part like just the even numbers out of the natural numbers and that is a proper part because there's some part of the natural numbers that's not even i odd numbers uh, so it's a proper part but it's not really smaller like it's the same cardinality right so this is thing we were talking about just a moment ago so it, it, with infinite sets euclid's maxim fails and if you just suppose that euclid's maxim is true in the real world then there really would be a contradiction if Hilbert's Hotel existed in the real world because it violates Euclid's maxim. But then, you know, the question is, is Euclid's maxim actually true of the real world or not? And it just seems like you can't just suppose that it is to derive the contradiction. Um, anyway, so that's that's the the argument. It's seem, it's a, it seems very weak to me. But anyway, the, the reply to it, and it, my friend Wes Morriston came up with this first in a number of different publications over the last, 20 years, I guess. I think the first was in 2000. Um, but he's basically saying, look, if the number of events in the past has this Hilbert's Hotel property, if, if the past has no beginning, then if you just think about an endless future, um, that would have the same properties, right? Like there's, there's imagine uh, an angel who's just been singing praises to God forever, one every 10 seconds, let's say. Um, how many, if, if time had no beginning and he's an immortal being, how many praises has he sung, right? Then the answer is infinitely many, and that's supposed to be absurd. But then if you say, well, let's just imagine that he sings a praise to God one every 10 seconds for the rest of the future, and how many praises will he sing? Well, it's the same answer, right? It's, it's in, infinitely many. And if, that's, if there being infinitely many of them is too weird for that thing to exist, then you know, if, if that means that the past must have a beginning, the same thing should apply for the future, right? Like, it, it, you know, here, here's a way to think about it being like Hilbert's Hotel. It's like all of the events that will happen in the future, there's actually infinitely many of them. And then as stuff happens, you know, as something stops being future and becomes present, that's like a guest checking out of Hilbert's Hotel and leaving the hotel. Um, when you could ask, well, how many guests were there before he left? Infinitely many. How many guests are there after he leaves? Still infinitely many, right? The same amount. And that's, you know, the future, the, the totality of events in the future seems to be having that property. So if it's weird in the past, it seems like exactly the same weird things happening in the future. And if Hilbert's Hotel is enough to say that the past must have a beginning, it must also show that the future must have an end. But, you know, Craig thinks that um, the afterlife is such that it's like one event happening after another, it's like, you know, spiritual events or something. But in principle, it's a type of experience that you could be counting or singing praises or something and it's just one thing happening after another forever without an end and the idea is well if that's what it's like and it's not just some unification or some you know annihilation or something if the afterlife actually is just a bit like being alive one thing happening after another then um craig thinks it doesn't have an end right but the hilbert's hotel argument seems to show that it you know it must do, at least if if you think it works to show that the past must have a beginning, then it shows that the future must have an end. So that's 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 the argument, basically. Does that make, does that make sense? That makes, yeah, that yeah, that make, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, I was having a little bit of a hard time following it when we were uh, debating him, but uh, that's well, that's my clear. I have one more question for you, and then I'm just gonna let everybody else talk. Um, and this has absolutely nothing to do with that, but I know how much you love presuppositionalists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, so recently I've come across a couple people that are um, kind of regurgitating an old argument that I've always just taken to be kind of a, <clears throat> a misunderstanding of the application of uh, semantics almost, um, is the, the problem of the one and the other. Um, and so they've kind of adopted this as a way to argue for their ultimacy. Um, if uh, Do you have any kind of... Um, response to someone that would you know say to you like you know what is your solution to the one and how how can you explain or like is there a need of a like a unifier for everything almost in order to uh, even understand uh the universe that we reside in right so this um when you're talking about presupp 
the argument, uh, the one and the many argument. Um, most of the time, this goes back to a really um, an unclear um, series of passages by Van Til, and then um, this weird, uh, weird. I don't know how to describe him. This guy called Rush Dooney, who wrote a book, who was a, I think, a pupil of um, Van Til. We wrote a book, I think, called The Problem of the One and the Many, um, where he popularized this. And maybe he did a master's thesis or something that focused on it. And ever since then, I think um, Banson um, picked up this as as one of the kind of strands. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the worst, weakest part of that tradition, which, as you pointed out, I'm not a big fan of anyway. Um, it seems to me that whatever Van Til, Van Til's a very unclear writer, he's not a native English speaker, uh, writes philosophical prose, but he was writing in the like 30s to 50s, and a lot of what he's doing is engaging with people who are in a tradition of um, what's called British idealism, and it's a very straight, it's kind of Hegel, neo-Hegelian um, language, it's very complicated, it's very difficult to read. And it's super easy to miss the nuances of um, uh, the context that he's writing in and what the debates are that they're talking about and how he's responding and what he's saying. It's not standard straightforward. It's not like picking up someone like Kripke or David Lewis or something. I and mean, even then, they can be difficult to read. But, you know, this is weird. And I don't, I don't pretend to get the... I couldn't reconstruct the argument for you, but effectively... Um, <laughs> It's supposed to be, you know, I mean, it's something like this, right? Is it something like, along the lines of saying, um, <laughs> and don't ask me what my, most of this means, but unless you um, have uh, as a foundational concept or something, uh, you, you either have unity or plurality. Um, and then the problem is if you have unity as your found, foundational concept, then predication becomes impossible because you can't distinguish one thing from another because you've just got unity at the basis of everything. And if you've got plurality at the basis of everything, then you can't um, you can't identify anything. One thing is the same as the other, right? So predication is impossible as well. And the only way that you can get around this problem, supposedly, is by positing a trinity, which is both one thing and pl a plurality of things at the same time. Now, you know, so many questions there. I don't understand what it means to have a foundational principle being one of those two categories. I don't understand what that means. I've never found myself doing that. You know, I don't know. I've got, you know, I'm 37 years old. I've managed to get this far through life without ever pl positing a plurality or unity. So I'm not sure what, what I should be, why I should be doing that. Um, I, you, but whatever, let's say that there was some problem there. It doesn't, it's not clear to me how positing a thing, which is sort of mysteriously both of those at the same time. I mean, what is, what does that even mean? It's, you know, that's just a hard to understand, if not impossible to understand um, collection of words, it seems to me. So I, I don't understand how if you just start with something even weirder, that that's supposed to solve this problem. There's no argument, there's no premises in a conclusion where it's like logically one thing follows to another one. Um, I suspect it's a kind of possibly Van Til not being a great philosopher in the first place and then him misunderstanding or misreading or misstating some argument. Um, this to me, the way it's been rendered to me, and again, this could be a bastardized understanding. I mean, I'm aware of the, <clears throat> of the platonic understanding of the one and the many, but the way that it's basically been rendered to me is almost, they, it's almost like they jumped onto like, um, attempt by um, uh, quantum physicists and physicists and things like that to like have a unified theory of everything. And basically I think that the idea behind it is, is that um, if it, you know, that the universe must necessarily have like a, a unified something like there must be something that um, unifies all of this together and that unifier is God. Um, and that if you don't, um, if you don't acquiesce to that unifier, then you're always just hunting and picking diversity um and the diversity is not enough to give you any kind of um uh ability to understand the world intelligibly um uh, or even you know understand the things that you are uttering to one another because you know you have to have that unifier in order to understand the whole picture and if you can't understand the whole picture then you can't understand 
parts. Right. So, so I mean, I there's loads of stuff that seems wrong about that as well. I mean, I understand the parts um, partially themselves, and I don't understand the whole. Right. That's how. So it seems to me what happens is that you um, find yourself, um, you know, you become sort of self-aware at some point in your life after you've already been walking around and doing stuff for a bit anyway. You know, it's hard to say exactly when you first sort of have a penny drop philosophical moment where you go like, oh, fuck, I like exist. What the fuck's this? Right. But at some point that happens and you might start questioning like the foundations of things. But, it, you know, you're already you've already got a bunch of concepts and you're already doing things. and You already to some extent know things like that. It's Tuesday or that, you know, you're awake and stuff like this. And you already have those things without any idea of what unifies anything, if anything does, right? So the idea that you can't know anything until you've got a unifying concept just seems, you know, from a practical point of view, obviously false. Like I picked up stuff, simple rudimentary things like what time is it, what's my name and stuff, before I had any philosophical understanding of anything, right? It, it comes the other way around, right? I pick up things slowly, piece by piece, without a unifying principle. Um, and it's only after I've got a lot of that under my belt that I can start to wonder if anything unifies it, right? You know, speculations about physics and stuff didn't come first in civilization. Right? We didn't have to work out what the particle physics was before we could start talking to each other. It's the other way around. Mm -hmm. So it just seems to me like not true that it's a kind of Cartesian myth that you have to sort out the foundations before you can sort anything else out. Um, so I, I don't buy any of that stuff anyway. It just seems to me an open question whether um you know it, it certainly would be nice if there was a completely unified knowable order of things um but it, it's it doesn't seem i don't i don't really get how it, it has to be the case that there is um for instance is there a smallest level of structure in physical material i don't know if there is i mean there might be but i can sort of imagine it just going down and down forever and if it did that no matter how much we studied it we'd never really know uh, we'd never be able to explain exactly how everything worked because it would just keep going down forever. Um, and I, it seems to me that that's an open possibility. So so the idea of there, there must be a unifying thing and we need to know what that is before we can know anything, all of that's just, I just think that's all bollocks, basically. Um, I, I, complete, I approach it completely the other way around. Well, I'm glad you're back on Discord, man. Okay, good. All right, thanks again for coming on, Alex. Uh, so we have a question from Pacho Herrera, was who was wondering if you think it's unreasonable to believe that the universe could have spontaneously come into existence from some sort of uh, primordial uh, physical stuff, like matter. Do I think it's unreasonable to think that the universe came into being from some primordial matter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I mean... What does if there was some primordial matter? I would have I would have thought that was also part of the universe. I mean, I'm not so what I don't really know what the the term means there. It, yeah, I guess you'd have to ask him um, how he's using the word universe here, because if it's referring to all of physical reality, perhaps then I mean, you may not believe that that came from some other kind of come from some other physical stuff, right? Yeah, right, right. Like so, this. If you want to just sort of say, um, I mean, there's, there's there's a whole bunch of physical theories, but, um, and I'm not the right person to ask about them, that say that the universe, the universe, you know, that what happened before, whatever it is, 13.8 billion years ago, the Big Bang or whatever, is is um, some previous type of physical universe, maybe slightly differently. Um, there's like loop quantum gravity. Lee Smolin has a weird version of that. Um, uh what's he called um oh christ what's that uh physicist guy in oxford um pen roger penrose has um this theory called cyclic conformal geometry i think it's called um where i mean i can't explain that but it's uh on his theory the previous eons of stuff that happens before the big bang too i mean so yeah i mean again it seems like an open question probably an empirical question not really a philosophical one so um a philosophical question would be like something like um you know because that's pushing off the philosophical question like 
was there some previous physical stuff that happened before this physical stuff? I mean, yeah, probably, right? I don't know, at least conceivable that that's right. Um, and then the philosophical question would be something like, I mean, does it does all of like contingent reality, um, does it just stop at, at something contingent that just happened for no reason? Or does contingent reality have to bottom out in something necessary? So this is basically a kind of uh, argument from contingency. Um, and there my view, I think, is that like I, <laughs> I'm not sure. So if I think if what you mean is, well, this is a bit of a rabbit hole, right? But, you know, the way these things are often set out is, um, you know, it starts off with a statement of the principle of sufficient reason. And that says something like, look, every contingent um, fact or proposition, contingently true proposition, um, is explained. The, there's a reason why that thing is true, right? There's no, there aren't any contingently true propositions that don't have explanations for them. But you say, well, okay, well, what's an explanation? And you know, sufficient explanation or sufficient reason usually is taken to be something where if you if you state the sufficient reason that necessitates the thing you're trying to explain right so it like entails it logically um so it leaves it leaves nothing to any doubt right so i mean um if i don't know if say there was um say there was like i don't know say there's some water coming down uh, in a stream down the hill towards me or something i said that's doesn't have to be coming down the stream, right? It's contingent that it is. How come it is, right? Well, there'll be some prior state of the universe, like the water slightly higher up the hill or something, plus some laws of physics that are acting on that water, such that the combination of both of those two things logically entails the water being where it is now, right? And there you go, and that explains it. Um, if you have something weaker than that, where it's like, well, there's this prior state of the universe where the water was like slightly higher up the hill, and then the laws of physics are like in the thank you for that, <laughs> where the uh, laws of physics are indeterministic, right? So that they allow for different things to happen with probabilities. Um, then you might question whether what that is, whether that really counts as an explanation, right? Because I mean, it still seems to leave unanswered the question of why. Um, you know why that sequence of things happened if there are many sequences of things that are compatible with those indeterministic laws and some of them have the water going some other place um then you think well why did that sequence of things happen here and then and, and really there's just no answer to that it just seems to be like that it just happened and that's it so you might question whether that counts as an explanation at all right so and if you're if you buy that type of thing then an explanation has to be really involved, like a logical Sorry about uh, that. It's okay. Um, yeah. So then, if you think that, then um, there's this argument by Van Ingwagen, which seems to show that um, that there there couldn't be an explanation, um, if in that sense of explanation, for all of contingent reality. There either has to be just brute contingent um, facts, or uh, no contingent facts at all. Um, there either has to be some contingent facts or no contingent facts at all. And that's commonly called uh, modal collapse. Um, and in, in response to that, theists try and say something like, well, I mean, uh, a necessary God, necessarily existing God, can like freely choose to bring contingent things into the world, like the first event or whatever. Um, and, and the way they get around the modal collapse is to say something like, well, he has like a reason, like a non-necessitating reason or something. Um, and this is the the line Alexander Proust takes. And I think that I I think that ultimately this and I can't I don't have a good knockdown explanation of this, but it does seem to me that what's going on there is um, is we've just moved away from um, a full explanation. You just have to accept something weaker than that. And it feels like at that point we've we've just let go of the the intuitive commonsensical notion of the principle of sufficient reason and we've helped ourselves to a substantially weaker one um and and then and then you can i mean it, there are lots of like uh, interesting avenues that are opened up by that like i mean there are there are different ways of explaining um once we've once we don't have to have a 
a necessitating explanation, which can allow um, people who don't believe in God to, to come up with similar ways of, of, of talking about that. So, I, I mean, there's a lot to say there, and that, that's not very helpful to some extent. But um, it's, yeah, it's an interesting area that I'm actively thinking about at the moment. So I might have but more to it, say about that some next time. If, um, if it's a libertarian free choice, that just seems mm -hmm. to be clearly brute contingency, regardless of what Proust says. Yeah, so Proust thinks that there uh, can be reasoned, um, so he distinguishes between like non-reasoned libertarian free choices and reasoned libertarian free choices, right? So um, I think he goes, I think the distinction comes from James, um, William James, but uh, yeah, so I mean, he has something to say there, and Proust is, is, is not by any means stupid, right? I don't know if you've ever actually read any Proust, Jack, but he's... I, I avoid doing it at this point. <laughs> um, after yeah, I started doing it, uh, I realized it was a mistake to continue. Getting, but, uh, getting pwned but too yeah, much, didn't like it. Do you, think, do you think that it escapes from brute contingency? If it's Because on compatibilism, right, it seems like there is a way you... Well, I don't think there's a way you can get away from brute contingency. but um, But it seems like it's clearer, I guess, in the libertarian case, right? Which is what Bruce is defending, I take it, right? I just don't see how... He is defending that, yeah. Yeah, I just don't see how they can get away from that. So when you say brute contingency, and are you distinguishing so there's, that there's, from non-brute contingency? There's going to be an explanation for why the agent does either A or B, mm -hmm. right? There could be a sufficient explanation for that. But ultimately, why the agent does A rather than B is just not something that has any explanation as far as I can tell on Proust's view. Well, so he's going to say something like, look, the agent has reason one for doing A and reason two for doing B. And when he picks A over B, then the reason partially explains him doing it. Do you it want me to start? Explain. Do you want me to st yeah, it part, it, well, that's, that's not saying anything more than that the reasons, the conjunction of reasons that one has to do A and B explain why one does either A or B. But that's not the question that, that I'm, that's being asked, right? Which is what explains why from that, those two options, you do one rather than the other, right? Well, I mean, I'm not going to defend Proust's of course view. you aren't going to defend it. <laughs> nonsense. All right. We don't have to <laughs> yeah, well, look, I think that uh, I'm not as confident to say it's nonsense. Uh, I think it's probably wrong, right? But, um, you know, if it was Matt Slick's argument, then I'd say, it's okay, just, fine. You know, Something's English, gone horribly English wrong people, somewhere. But... English people are really nice, you know. They have to be nice. But look, if it was Matt Slick's argument, and when Matt Bell put that argument to you, then you know it didn't go anywhere. But Proust is worth thinking, you know, it's worth thinking more about. It's like some of these guys, Coons as well, they're worth thinking, uh, thinking about what they're saying and paying attention to it because it's not they're not stupid. Um, you know, there there isn't going to be an easy, straightforward, simple thing that's gone wrong there. Um so I don't know. My my view is I'm unsettled about. I, I don't know. I'm still making my mind up. So about. you so you you think that they may have a way of avoiding conceding a brute contingency there at the heart of libertarian free will. You're saying you think that's an option that you take seriously, even though you think it's probably wrong. Well, I think I I'm, I take I think that Proust. I'm going to read. Um, most of the book on um, most of his book on the Kalam, and I have his book on the PSR, and I haven't really gone into it in enough detail. But like the stuff on paradox and infinity and stuff made me think, all right, this guy knows what he's talking about, and he has thought about these things very deeply. And I'd be very surprised if he was if he just had never thought about it before. Um, no, so I imagine that he's got something to say. It's going to be yeah, no, I, I, I'm not saying he hasn't thought about it. I'm saying that what he's come up with is just an obfuscation. Okay. Right? Well, you might be right. There's a you motivated know. reason there. So when you read that and, you know, when you finally read that book on the PSR, just get back to me if you think he 
Sure. Shapes. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. All right. Um, I had, I had a possibly quick question following up on the uh, the Craig discussion. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, Craig would say that the number of future events is merely potentially infinite. Um, I'm just wondering what you think he would say is the difference between saying the number of future of events is potentially infinite and the number of future events is actually infinite, right? I mean, he would say that the latter is metaphys metaphysically impossible, but like that that can't be the only difference. Like, what would it mean to say, on his view, that the number of future events is actually infinite? Well, Craig thinks Craig uses the term actually infinite in a in a narrow, very specific way, right? And um, it's not how other people in uh, philosophy of mathematics use the term. Um, so, yeah, okay. I'm not going to go into all the history of, of yeah, that yeah. term. It's very complicated history. Um, but basically, Craig, Craig just means, right, a set or a collection is actually infinite if and only if um, there exists a bijection from a proper part to the whole, from the elements of the proper part of a proper part to the elements of the whole. And what that means is just simply that you can line up in a one to one correspondence um the elements of a proper part with the elements of the whole so the even numbers are a proper part of the natural numbers and you can line them up two with one four with two three with six whatever um and um show that there's a one-to-one -one relation between them so anything that has that property is what craig thinks is actually infinite um but you can do that because you can you know it, you can do that with the past events if there's if there's no beginning to time, uh, you could number each, I don't know, second that had happened. Um, and, and then you could find a bijection between a proper part and the whole. And you can do that with the future too, if if um, it has no end, right? That's what it would be to be actually infinite, it would be the number of events in the future would be such that you could show that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a proper part of that and the whole of it. Um, and you can do that, it seems to me, as straightforwardly. But to get around that objection, Craig says, well, because of temporal becoming, right, those events um, don't all exist, right? Something like this anyway. It's difficult to be charitable here. Um, but his view is something like the, the moving now kind of rolls on into the future and all that's real is what's left in its wake, right? So if we put a pin at this time now, like I don't know Thursday, saying we put a pin in Thursday and watch the the moving now rolling off into the future. We'd find that after one day had passed, there'd be one day of the future, namely Friday, and after another day had passed, there'd be two days in the future, Friday and Saturday. And you know, as as we let the moving now roll off into the distance, we'd find that the number of events in the future from now has increased, right? And it's increasing and increasing. It's always a finite number. Um, but as there's no end to the future, the moving now is going to just keep rolling away from us. And it's like a line that it's, it's it's growing and growing. And there's no point where the line stops growing. It's always finite, but it's kind of approaching infinity as a kind of limit that it right, approaches but never arrives at. So that's what he thinks is, that's his best way of explaining it. That's like the best version of that that he's got but you know the kind of obvious it seems obvious to me anyway because i've gone over this so many times and, and you know i have a paper published on this where we go into quite a lot of detail about it but like what's going on there is that we put a pin in today and let the future roll on ahead of us so i mean what we're talking about is the interval between now and the present which is rolled on into in you know to the left or whatever um so we we're, we're measuring an interval which is strictly speaking behind the present, right? measuring an interval of the past, right? And I agree that that interval is increasing potentially infinitely, but that's not that's not what anybody means by the future, right? If I, you know, it's not like the future today is. I mean, to, I guess today is the the future of yesterday, but the future is like stuff that's in the future of today, right? It's just the future simpliciter is all those events that haven't happened yet, not all those events that. Uh, are in between yesterday and today. Nobody means by the term the future, the interval between some past event and now. 
they just mean the events that are later than now. Um, so, you know, you can build a, a, a thing which is potentially infinite by, you know, introducing this notion of temporal passage, but only by changing um, subject, really, from what's future to what will have happened um, at some later point. And that's why in the debate with him, I said he he shifts from the simple future tense to the future perfect tense. Um, and I genuinely don't think he understood. And he said he read the paper, but it's difficult to, un I think he briefly read the paper, but I don't think he's, or he just has a kind of blind spot and cannot understand this point. Right, because he, he maintained that the simple future is, is fine, right? He, he's fine saying that the, uh, yeah. the number of future <laughs> events in the, the number of events that will occur in the simple future sense is still potentially infinite. That's right. And he said that I made a modal scope fallacy or something. And um, he he uh, went and wrote a blog post about it. Or, well, you know, one of these ask, ask, what's it called? Anyone, reasonable faith, you can ask a question right. and he answers it. And someone asked him a question and said, oh, I saw your debate with that Malpass guy, blah, blah, blah. And then Craig explained what he thought was the modal scope fallacy again, but it was, you know, it was different again from what he said in the first place. But anyway, ne neither time did he capture the argument that I was making, um, which I think is fairly straightforward and seems to me totally, <laughs> totally un indisputable. And um, so it goes something like this, right? If, um, let's say somebody is going to start counting whole integers now, right? So he, he just starts saying, okay, one, two, three. And let's just suppose that that person keeps doing that without stopping and um, says says an integer at the same um, interval. So let's say one a second, right? And they just keep going and nothing contingent like them dying or going mad or anything happens. They just keep doing it without stopping. Now, if that's, it seems to me that Craig thinks that's possible because he thinks the future has no end to it because he thinks, you know, even when you die, you're going to wake up in the afterlife and you could just start counting then, right? And just nothing would ever stop you. So um, he thinks that's possible that you start counting and never stop. But it seems to me what follows from that is that if it's possible that you start counting and never stop, then for each number um, n, it, you will count that number, right? There's no number, there's no natural number, no finite number such that you won't eventually count it. You will eventually count it. But then also, it, it then it just, that just means that for each natural number, you'll count that number. And then it just, and then all you have to do is say, well, how many na numbers are there such that I'll count them? And the answer to that is, well, what's the cardinality of all of the natural numbers? That's, that's, it's Aleph naught, right? That's the, that's to say, it's this um, number, which is uh, the first actually infinite number. It's the first number that has the property that Craig thinks is actually infinite, you know, the bijection right. thing. So the cardinality, it just, if, you, if it's possible that you start counting and never stop, then it's possible that you count each number. Then it's possible that you count infinitely many numbers, right? That, that's a string of inferences that's valid. Um, <laughs> he accuses you of the modal, uh, modal uh, shift. Yeah. <laughs> so he thinks that the modal shift is something like, if you say, um, he said that, you know, mother from mother. every person has a mother, that there's a mother um for for the whole human race or something now if that was right what i'd be saying was um it will be the case uh that for each number i count that number that would be the first premise and then the second premise would be um uh for each number sorry sorry the first number the, so I've, I've mixed them around sorry this is confusing but um i would i would be saying for each number it will be the case that i count that number first premise, second premise, it will be the case that for each number, I count that number. And they sound the same, and it's only when you write them down and see the difference, but I'm effectively swapping around the quantifier that ranges over numbers and the, the temporal operator that says it will be that. Um, the first one says, for each number, there will be, you know, each individual number taken on its own, there will be a time where I count that number. So there'll be a time where I count 10, there'll be a time where I count a million in 10, whatever blah 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 each number has its own time where that number is counted and then he thinks from that i'm inferring um that i'm making the mistake of saying that there is a specific time at which every number is counted 
like like at one specific time, like next right. Tuesday, where I recite all of the numbers at the same time or something. I mean, like that would be to mirror exactly the the mother inference that he thought that he said I was making wrong. But I mean, it just seems clear to me that I, there's no at no point did I did I commit even implicitly to having to suppose that somebody says every single natural number at the same time. Right? Like, how did that feature in my argument? So it just seems to me that he didn't understand what the argument was and assumed there must be some kind of, I mean, maybe he, he maybe if he had more time to think of expressing it better, he, he would be able to say it. I mean, the other way of looking at it is that the, the scope fallacy is supposed to be saying f um, from each to all or something. But actually, if, hopefully if I said it correctly the first time around, you can state the argument without having to say the word all at any point. You just say each. Uh, you know, if 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 George starts counting and never stops, then he for each number he'll count that number. Um, if he'll count each number, then the number of numbers he'll count is actually infinite, right? The, I didn't say all at any point there, so it can't be that the argument switches from each to all. So I mean, I, I I'm still baffled to to see why he thinks there's a modal scope fallacy there, um, and it seems to me there just isn't. So um, yeah. Yeah, it seems obvious that um, if you will count a set of numbers, that I mean, you can do that by counting each of the numbers individually. Mm -hmm. So if you, <laughs> that's, I mean, it seems that would entail that very straightforward. Though. In fact, it, I think the c even clearest way of putting it is that the the rule of inference, if any, that I'm actually using here, is, it goes like this: it's to say something like if um, if um, every set, uh, every element in a set uh, has a property P, then the cardinality of elements that are P is the same as the cardinality of elements in the set, right? So that's a formal way of saying it, but think about it like this. If I say something like every child in the classroom is five years old and there's 30 children in the classroom, then it follows that there's 35 year old children in the classroom, right? Like that's the inference that I'm using. I'm saying if every number has the property of being such that it will be counted, right? If each number, let's say, has the property of being such that it will be counted, then the number of numbers that will be counted is just the same as the number of numbers that there are, right? That's the inference that I'm saying. And it seems to me that it's obviously uh, valid. There's, <laughs> it's not even a head scratcher. It's trivial, right? So, um, yeah, I wish I'd expressed it like that in the debate, but it's hard to explain, hard to think on your feet sometimes. I think that's fair enough. Um, I had a question from Timber, who is warning, um, continuing on Craig. What do you think, on his view, it would mean for time to begin to exist? Or does time begin to exist on his view? Well, um, <laughs> it's, it's yes and no. I mean, Craig's view is very strange, very unorthodox, and almost nobody uh, holds to it, apart from, like, obviously all the kind of Craig, Craigites or whatever, like everyone on the internet <laughs> thinks it, but no one, in, no one else thinks it. So he says something like, look, um, uh, obviously, God has always existed, um, but God's existence is timeless um, for Craig. And it's difficult to say this in a way that doesn't sound absurd, but, you know, up until the point where he made time and then it was temporal. So I mean, normally people would say um, that an object is is timeless if it doesn't exist at any time, if it exists, but it doesn't exist at any time. Um, and Craig thinks that that's true of God, but only up until the point where he does start existing. And, you know, most people would say, okay, that doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, if there is a time where he's where he exists at time, then he's not timeless. Um, so it, you can't be both. Uh, Craig seems to think that you, that you can have that um, it's kind of difficult to actually sort of formally derive a contradiction from it because it just feels like um, the concepts are being used in ways that don't feel like right. So it just it sounds more like it's just sort of incoherent rather than inconsistent. Um, 
so yeah, I, I, I just don't understand Craig's view there enough um, to, to show a, a contradiction. But I, I, I'm certainly not persuaded by it because it just sounds like nonsense to me. All right. Um, moving on, we have a question from James SC. Um, do you think that scenarios like or Hilbert's Hotel and the Grim Reaper paradox can be used to show that there's troubling behavior in the infinite divisib divisibility of things that might be continuous, like time or space? Like, um, could someone use an argument like that to show that if they think it's convincing for like the finitude of the past and stuff like that, to show that time and space can't be infinitely divided? Yeah, so, I mean, the Grim Reaper argument is traditionally um, an argument that shows that time is um, can't be um, uh, continually divided, right? That there must be some point at which it, it can't be divided any further. Um, so, I mean, and, and the argument comes about in a book by this guy called Jose Bernadetti, uh, Bernadetti, who um, yeah, was a, a philosopher, I think, at Harvard, um, died recently. Um, and he's cool. And the book, that book uh, is called Infinity, an essay in metaphysics is is like, I think that you could probably find a free PDF version of it. And it's, it's mind boggling, uh, crazy, fun. It's kind of exciting to read. I mean, I really recommend reading it. It's, it's great. Um, uh, and yeah, he, it was an argument that he it's, well, it's not an argument so much, but it, he stated it as a kind of thought experiment, I guess. Um, and the way he put it to begin with is um, in terms of like deafening gongs, right? So you imagine this, you know, someone hitting a gong that's so loud that like it immediately deafens anybody who hears it. Um, he says, okay, imagine there's one of those that goes off at like 12, 12 o'clock. Um, and there's another one that goes off uh, half a minute earlier than that. And there's another one that goes off 15 seconds earlier than that one. And another one that goes off I mean, seven and a half seconds earlier than that one. So I eat the in interval between them halves each time. So you can fit an infinite number of them before you get to the full minute prior to the 12 o'clock gong. Um, and so there's what we've got then is a sequence of strikes of this gong that has a last element, but it doesn't have a first one, right? Um, but it's such that if you were to hear any of them, you would go deaf. Um, now, the thought is, well, you couldn't arrive at 12 o'clock um, and be deafened by the last gong because you, you must have already been deafened by one of the earlier ones, right? Um, but you couldn't have been the one before that because, you know, there would, you would have already gone deaf when that one had, had struck. So there's no gong that, that you would still have your hearing in order to, right? But there's also no first gong. So there's none in particular that would be the one that caused you to lose your hearing, right? That's the original Grim Reaper argument. Um, and what it is supposed, I mean, he's playing around with the idea. I mean, he's actually a defender of the actual infinite, thinks that time is infinitely divisible, but whatever. It's a, he's, he's exploring these kind of weird things that you'd have to think your way through. Um, and then that argument's taken up by uh, by Alexander Proust again, and um, Robert Coons. Um, Coons has a paper in 2014 where it's the Grim Reaper argument where he explains it for continuous time, and then he says, just you know, imagine each one of these is basically spaced out at even intervals throughout a beginningless past. Right then, um, you, you wouldn't have your hearing as of now. Um, but obviously it wouldn't have been the one that happened, you know, a second ago because you would have already lost your hearing. Wouldn't be the one before that either, blah, blah, blah. So you can get the same paradox. It seems to just show that time couldn't be beginning, beginningless. Um, I mean, you know, you can, something about these arguments is a little bit too, if they work, they'd be a little bit too successful. I mean, you can also show that space must have a, um, must be finite as well, because you can just imagine these things being laid out in space and generate the same, paradox right um and I, it seems to me that you can do pretty much the same thing to show that the future must be finite too so we is an a priori argument that if it worked for any of these it would be sort of devastating it would be well not devastating but it would have such huge scope that it starts to seem implausible that we could really derive that from an a priori argument right space is in space must have a smallest unit time must have a smallest unit 
Time must be finite in extent, both past and future. Space must be finite in extent in every direction. Blah blah blah. It just feels like, I mean, there must. I'm much more inclined to think that though I can't spot it directly, that there's something that's gone wrong at the basis of all of those arguments, than that there's such a simple way to show such significant ontological um, things out of an a priori argument. I just don't think. I don't think any a priori arguments are, are really going to be that powerful. So, um, yeah, I mean, I could say more about that, but um, that's my kind of outline of, of the view. Uh, I'm the person who asked the question. Can I ask uh, one more unrelated question? Sure. Uh, which, uh, which is, um, what, what do you think about, um, I don't know if you've heard of it, the a grievance studies affair, aka the SoCal Squared affair with Peter Bogosian and Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay. Um, I know. I've where, where have never you heard, heard of it. it. No. Right. No, never mind then. All right. Um, we had a question from another question from Pacho. Do you think that God's omnipotence fails to conform to the principle of parsimony? Um, because we could equally posit a God with merely the capacity to create the world and not like some maximal power or greatness right um i i i don't know how i mean josh rasmussen obviously thinks right differently to that right that any limitation is kind of arbitrary so um you know, it, we're weighing up theoretical virtues here. It's difficult to see how exactly that weighing scale is supposed to go. I mean, parsimony is is a consideration that, that that's helpful a lot of the time. If it's easy to see that one theory is everything else equal but less parsimonious, then okay, great, fair enough. I know what I'm doing. But if um, once we leave clear cases and start to think about deciding big fundamental ontological questions with nothing but the evaluation of like several different um, intellectual virtues or virtues of rationality or whatever, like um, explanatory power, ad hocness, simplicity, blah, 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 beauty, whatever. Um, then it does, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I think you can argue the toss on that in almost any direction. Um, so I prefer an argument to have something a little bit more substantial to it than that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, could you argue that it's not very parsimonious? Yes, sure you could. Would it be particularly persuasive to anybody? Probably not, right? Because it's so finely balanced. And so, yeah, I, I'm not really a big fan of those types of arguments. Yeah. Too much going on at the same time. All right. Uh, I had a question from Dio who was wondering if you had any thoughts on modal skepticism or kind of what are our limits of modal knowledge? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so I'm rather partial to modal skepticism to some extent, right? Like, I mean, um, I think that um, we can tell certain things fairly, I mean, so this is, think about it like a sliding scale of confidence, like certain modal inferences seem relatively straightforward and easy like um this is actual therefore this is possible that seems pretty solid right um and then you know you can construct very um well there are um so there are axioms of different systems of modal logic where it's far from clear how connected they can be to your intuition um and it feels like very difficult to think that you could sort of know them in the same way that you can know these sort of basic truths. Um, like if something's necessary, then it's possible, that type of thing. So I'm I'm rather inclined to think that our you know, we should be skeptical when people say claims that are far away from that core set of things that, that are obvious, um, or where the chain of inferences that leads from something obvious is obscure. Right, we should we should be dubious about that. So, when people say things like, um, uh, you know, that it's metaphysically necessary that there couldn't be an infinite hotel or something, and it's like, I mean, show me the contradiction, right, from stuff where it's all straightforward and non-controversial. Um, otherwise, don't tell me that it's just intuitive or 
um, that you just have that knowledge in some other way. Like, so yeah, I'm rather skeptical that you know when people say things like uh, that they 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 know uh, metaphysical metaphysically necessary truths. Um, to put it mildly, I'm skeptical about that. Often it's fun to just sort of run with it to see what happens when you accept various assumptions or whatever. So I'm not against playing the game, but like the idea that you can just sort of state a bunch of metaphysical necessities as if, and, and that they're not just platitudinous things, like if it's actual, then it's possible. Um, you know, I, I think that's, I think that's bollocks as well. I think, you know, that's, it's fanciful, you know, speculative and fanciful. And anyone tries to tell you that they know those types of things, I think that they're, they're saying stuff that they don't know. Um, yeah. So yeah, thumbs up to modal skepticism, broadly speaking. All right. Fair enough. Um, I had a bit of a question on the, going back to the Grim Reaper stuff and mm -hmm. uh, um, you had this, um, dry eternity uh problem that you proposed on sure your yeah yeah um and one and one of the principles that was involved there was was you called k3 which said that god can act based on his presently available knowledge of future events mm -hmm. so I, I just i was wondering how if someone could respond in this way to that um suppose they affirm that god sometimes acts based on knowledge of the future but can't always do so or at least can't always do so in certain ways. Um, so if they think that the hypothetical does involve or entail a set of impossible actions, then they might just infer that this is just one of those cases where can't, God can't act on um, that future knowledge or, or at least can't act on it in, in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, that's interesting. Um, Sorry, do you finish? Did you want to? Yeah, yeah, that? yeah. That was more or less it. Okay, so the idea then is that um, so in that paradox, right? The way this works is that um, so it's a bit like the Grim Reaper paradox, but the idea here is to try and spell out how it applies to the future too. And the problem with the Grim Reaper paradox, straightforwardly, for just saying, you know, the Grim. So the Grim Reaper. I was talking about gongs earlier, but you know, let's spell out the Grim Reaper paradox as said by Coons, is more like, you know, there's there's a Grim Reaper who's going to kill you if it, if you get to 12 o'clock, um, if you're still alive, right? But there's also another one at like 11.59. He'll kill you if you get to 11.59, blah, blah, blah. And there's an infinite sequence goes back forever. Then we get that contradiction. I mean, then you could say, well, maybe there's just an infinite sequence of Grim Reapers that stretches off to the future, right? And, and that each one is, well, that each one's going to kill you if um, none of the others in the future of them will, right, to mirror it perfectly. So like the um, 1201 Reaper, he'll kill you, but only if no later Reaper will kill you, right? If some later Reaper will kill you, he'll, he'll, he lets you go, right? He lets you carry on. Um, but now all, all of a sudden, the well, now we've mirrored it like that. It seems like, well, hold on that 12 o'clock or 1201 Reaper, he has to know the future. He has to know what's going to happen in the future, whether to let you go or not. Um, and, you know, how could he know the future? Maybe you might think, right? Um, and that's pretty much how Coons responded to Cohen when he made this argument. Um, so, so Cohen said, you know, let's just stipulate there's a bunch of reapers, but each one will kill you if and only if no future reaper will. And Coons comes back and says, well, you know, how would they know that? Basically, um, knowledge is like one way it's causal and it doesn't go backwards in time um and so cohen's reply was to say well you know god could just tell them right he could just reveal the future to them and say you know whisper in their ear with divine revelation or whatever and tell them that either that there's a future reaper that does or that there's no future reaper that does either way they'll know what to do when he tells them that um and in my um, dry eternity paradox, I mean, it gets then lost in the details of like what God can reveal to its subjects and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I figured, well, I mean, it, you could just cut the reapers out, right? Let's just think about God doing something himself. And and I, it was January and I was doing a month without drinking. And it's, it occurred to me that there was this way that you could come up with the paradox, right? That sort of plays around with that idea. And the idea was, look, God says to himself, well, I want to give up drinking. Right? I'm tired of drinking, you know, holy water or whatever. 
and he says to himself, well, look, I'll have a drink now as a last final drink, um, if and only if I never drink it again in the future. Right? And then he consults his foreknowledge to check whether he has a drink ever again at any later day. And if he finds that he doesn't ever have a drink in the future, then he'll just have one beer now, and that's his last one, right, to celebrate. Um, but then the problem is that if he finds, you know, if he checks and sees, you know, on Monday, he finds, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you know, stretching off forever, he never has a drink, right? What happens is that he has a drink to celebrate, but then when it comes around to Tuesday and he checks again and he finds, oh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, stretching off forever, I never have a drink, I'll, I'll have my last drink now to celebrate, right? So he has a second final drink. But that means that, you know, on Monday, when he looked at the future, he didn't see a day where he drank. But actually, when it came around to Tuesday, he had a drink. So the, the thought is, is there's something kind of contradictory about that uh, situation. That's exactly the same contradiction that you get with the Grim Reaper paradox. Um, so then the thought would be, well, what's to stop that happening? And it seems like all that you need to suppose is that God can um, act off his uh, future knowledge. And I suppose your reply there is to say, well, God can act off his future knowledge, but um, only when that he actually has knowledge of a consistent situation or something, right? Like if it's contradictory, then he it, it, he won't act off it or something. I mean, uh, let me see if that captures the. Did you want to spell out the the, the objection precisely? Yeah, or either he it? either he can't um, act based on on certain knowledge, or he can't act in certain ways that would produce a set of inconsistent um, results or something. Like that. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, like, and I th so. I'm sympathetic to that response, right? But then I mean, just let's just think about it a little bit. So, I mean, what is it that he can't do? I mean, like, he can pick up a glass and put drink in it and drink it, right? It's not like that action on its own doesn't seem it's impossible at any point. Um, and you know, it's are you saying that there's some darkness that clouds his foreknowledge that he can't see what's going to happen? on Tuesday, right? I mean, which which thing is supposed to be impossible for him to do, right? I mean, it's I can see what you mean that like, if, if you take all of those, the whole description together, then you're led to an inconsistent situation. But the difficult thing is like, finding the thing where you say, well, that's the thing he can't do then, right? Like, where does the where does the drawbridge come down and stop him continuing? It feels like, you know, he can have a drink, sure, he can have a drink. He can see the future, sure, he can always see the future, right? Um, he could check what's going to happen tomorrow and, you know, save a dude if he felt like he was going to be a good guy tomorrow. You know, give him, let the lottery ticket flutter down in front of him because I checked and saw the future and saw he was going to be a nice guy or whatever. Like, God can do those sorts of things, it seems, right? That's that's the hypothesis anyway. So it feels difficult to, to deny, you know, which bit of that in particular are we actually denying, right? Right, because... Each part of it individually seems uh, perfectly possible for God to do. I mean, I, mm. I definitely don't wouldn't want to deny that God can know his future actions they don't, um, unless you're I don't know, some sort of open theist or something. But um, yeah, but um, yeah, I, mean, I guess they'd have to say something just like, uh, "No, God in this instance can't behave act in this way given the future facts." Um, yeah uh, yeah even though um you know independent of those future facts like that this sort of behavior would normally be in his capacity like, yeah and then so like okay i get i get the response and you know okay maybe that's right but then i sort of wonder why you we can't say the same thing about the setup with the grim reapers then right like so to begin with the idea is supposed to be well there could be a grim reaper now who kills you if you're alive now because that on its own seems intrinsically possible and it could be one of them, you know, yesterday, who kills you if you're alive yesterday. And that's intrinsically possible. There could be one the day before that, blah, blah, blah. Right? We have this, like, infinite sequence. But if you do have an infinite sequence, then you get into a contradictory situation, right? But And then the, you're supposed to say, well, the, the culprit there is the, the infinite extent of the past. But the thing you were just reaching for there was just to say, look, maybe God just can't do that for, like, some reason the combination is impossible. Well, maybe it's just the combination of the infinite past and there being Grim Reapers all over the place that are going to kill you that's impossible. But if you take either of those things out of it, then what you've got is possible on its own. 
So a finite past filled with Grim Reapers possible or an infinite past not filled with Grim Reapers possible, right? Like if you just show that the combination is not compossible, right? You haven't shown that either of the things on their own is impossible. And if it's supposed to be an argument that shows that the past can't be infinite, it won't do if it's just an argument that shows that a past filled with grim reapers, an infinite past filled with grim reapers isn't possible. Like, like I might even agree to that, but just still say, well, you haven't shown that a past not filled with grim reapers is impossible. Right. Maybe that's just the combination that you've shown is impossible. And it seems to me that that's a similar, a similar move to what you're making. So yeah, it's, I, I like these arguments where it's about symmetry about like, I'm, 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 trying to see if there's some difference between the way one approaches the past and the future, right? Like if a strategy works to diffuse an argument that's about the future, um, can you just apply it to an argument pointed at the past? And uh, that's what primarily interested me. Uh, that's uh, interesting. So um, we have a few more questions, but uh, are you fine going on a little bit longer or? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right. So I had a question from um, Osfox, who was wondering what you're. So you had a, a debate with um, or discussion with Andrew Loke, um, mm -hmm. and he was wondering uh, what some of your takeaways from that discussion were, spe specifically about the cause of the universe being God, and whether your, you know, beliefs on the those topics have have shifted um, since that debate. Um, certainly not because of talking to Andrew. Um, he he and i had a very long email exchange following that um yeah, most days actually for about two months uh he and i sent and received an email uh from each other um where we went to a lot more detail about that um and i so then the paper that i published with wes this year um the final section of that deals with his argument there, um, which he sort of brought up in that debate, but we didn't get into it in enough detail. But the argument there is this kind of accumulation argument, right? Which is like um, the idea there is supposed to be, well, God could have brought into being an object that exists, uh, persist, persists to this day, at any day in the past, right? So let's pick last Wednesday, God could have summoned into being um, a hotel room from nothing, right? And let's say that that hotel room persists until today. Um, and for each day in the past, God could have done this, a similar act of creation and brought up something into being that persists until today. Um, and so then it follows if there was 100 days in the past, um, it's possible that God spent each day making something that persists to today, in which case there'd be 100 of those things, maybe 100 hotel rooms. In existence today right it would be possible if there was a hundred days in the past um and then it's supposed to follow that if there was infinitely many days in the past it would be possible that there was infinitely many hotel rooms in the present and then you're supposed to think well there couldn't be infinitely many hotel rooms in the present therefore the past must be finite and it's very similar to hilbert's hotel the difference is that craig's version of hilbert's hotel it's just the the infinite sequence of events in the past themselves is supposed to be a, 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 like a Hilbert's hotel and in this one um it's the presence of of infinitely many things all together at the same time which is what's supposed to be problematic um so it's slightly different um and he and i talked about that argument daily for like two months um and i ended up that i wrote a bit at the end of that paper explaining why why I think that doesn't work, um, which I'm happy to talk about if that's interesting. Yeah, if you want um, to go into that briefly. Um... Well, okay, so then look, let me try and be brief about it to some extent. So imagine God has this ability to make stuff from nothing, right? Um, well, you might think, yeah, okay, so he can make one hotel room um, on a, at any given time. Well, presumably he could also make two hotel rooms at any given time, or three, right? Or, you know, as many as he liked, right? But if God could just summon into being infinitely many hotel rooms, just with the click of his fingers, all at once, then, you know, 
God's existence would entail the possibility of a Hilbert's Hotel. And if you think a Hilbert's Hotel is impossible, then you just reason modus tonans to the impossibility of God, right? So you don't want that if you're a theist because you, you've you suddenly worked out an argument that shows that God doesn't exist. So to get around that, what you have to do is say, look, God can summon stuff into existence, all right, but he can only summon finitely many things into existence at any one go, right? Otherwise, we've got this knockdown argument that shows that God doesn't exist. Um, so once you do that, um, then then think to yourself, well, look, if there was a Hilbert's Hotel now, the conclusion of Andrew's argument, um, what was it like yesterday before God added merely finitely many rooms to it, right? Let's say one room to it. Um, well, infinitely many minus one or any finite number is the same. Right? It's got the same cardinality. So if there's a Hilbert's Hotel in existence today and God can only make finitely many hotel rooms at a given time, there must have been a Hilbert's Hotel in existence yesterday, right? And the day before, and the day before, and forever, in fact. God God's, God could have been making hotel rooms and adding them to this hotel, but there was always an infinite hotel because none of those additions that God made changed the cardinality of the hotel in any way. Right? It didn't make it grow or shrink or do anything. Right? It was always infinite. Um, so... <laughs> If you think that, then actually the premise of Andrew's argument doesn't is naturally true, right? It, I mean, it could be that God makes a, a hotel room on any given day, right? But if he made one on every day, um, then what you're as actually asking us to think about is a situation where God adds a hotel room to a Hilbert's hotel. And that, that's already, you already should think that that's not possible if you think Hilbert's hotel isn't possible. So, um, there's this kind of sleight of hand where Andrew's argument works if you forget that Hilbert's Hotel is impossible for the premise and then remember it in the conclusion, right? And then blame the infinite extent of the past. Uh, but if you remember that Hilbert's Hotel is impossible throughout the argument, then you see that, um, that, that there's a perfectly consistent way of doing it. That means that you, um, God could have made, basically it's like saying God could have made a hotel on any given day, but not on every day in the past right and, and that that's enough actually that weaker premise is enough to get you um the premise that andrew needs for his argument so yeah it, it sort of diffuses it diffuses the argument all right um we'll move on to something else i guess um or did you want to say more about that <laughs> well <laughs> i could say more about that um well, you can read the paper that I published. It's called Endless and Infinite. Yeah. Yeah, that's the last section there. And it's it, there's a copy linked on my blog, so you don't have to, like, get it from a journal. Yes, I saw that. I see you just made it available, for now at least. Um, yeah, and it, it is I, – I am – I checked the small print. I am allowed to make it available. I just have to – when it's in print, I have to reference – specific edition that it comes from but it's still okay to use that all right i had a question from chad who was wondering if you are a determinist and uh, what your opinions are on that um i don't have a particularly strong opinion about that um so uh the uh, what i will say is that i'm not so on the one hand, I think there's a question about whether the laws of physics are deterministic, right? And that's an empirical question for a physicist. Um, this is the second question, which is, um, is free will compatible with determinism or not? And that's a question I'm not clear what I think. Um, then, you know, so am I a determinist or am I a compatibilist or, or probably not libertarian, I guess, but... Then there's a subsequent question, which I think I do have more to say about, which is kind of less interesting, maybe, which is that um, does this kind of logical fatalism or something in it? And that view seems to me obviously wrong, right? Which is just to say, you know, can there be truths about the future today um, which are compatible with you being free, uh, free in the libertarian sense, right? I'm not, I'm not saying that I think libertarian free will is true, but what I am saying is that if it was true, I still think that there could be truths about the future today, which is a position known as Occamism. Um, and my PhD thesis was about 
about that, basically. Um, so I, I'm certainly not a logical fatalist, which is the kind of strongest form of determinist. Um, but I'm 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 not a libertarian either. I'm somewhere in the middle, but I'm not really sure where I am. But you're saying that the fact that there's truths about the future now, right, that it, doesn't rule out um, libertarianism. Yeah, that's right. They can, it can still be possible that you do. So let's say it's true that it will be the P. Um, it can still be tr uh, true that it's possible that it will not be the P. That's those two statements are not logically contradictory. And a lot of people think they are, but, but those people are wrong because <laughs> they're not. All right. So, and you asked, also asked about theological fatalism. So if you're not, if you don't, um, if you're not worried about logical fatalism, do you think theological fatalism is, is, is no, not a problem? Yeah, right. Know. Theological fatalism is logical fatalism in a different terminology. Um, so it's, it's not a problem for the same reason. You know, God knowing what you're going to do tomorrow. Is compatible with you not doing it. Um, well, okay. So God knowing what you'll do is compatible with you doing something else apart from what God knows you'll do. Like suppose you're saying that if if God now knows that you'll I don't know have a sandwich tomorrow, that 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 can't be compatible with you not having a sandwich tomorrow. Well, it. I let me state clean, state it clearly. It, it's, Compatible with the possibility of you not acting that way. So obviously, um, anybody knowing anything um, isn't compatible with that thing being false, right? Because knowledge entails truth. So in that sense, obviously, if God knows I'm going to, you know, play the guitar tomorrow, then I am going to play the guitar tomorrow, right? But what what I'm saying is that God can know that I am going to play the guitar tomorrow, and it's true that it's possible that I won't play the guitar tomorrow. Like those two statements can be are not logically contradictory, in the sense that like I can know that it's raining outside, and it, you know that it is raining outside. If if it's true that I know that it's raining outside, then it's true that it's raining outside. But it's also true that it's possible that it's not raining outside. Like, but then, right, we're saying that it's it's not only possible that, like the world we're looking at in which it's not raining outside is also a world in which you don't know that it's going to rain outside or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So, in a, like, in other words, in, in the God example, you say, oh, it's possible that you don't play the gu guitar tomorrow, but only in the same sense that it's possible that God doesn't now know that you'll play the guitar tomorrow. Well, if I don't play the guitar tomorrow, in the world where I'm not playing the guitar tomorrow, that's also a world where God right. knows that I wasn't going to play the guitar tomorrow. Yeah, that's right. But all you have to do, all I'm saying, actually, is very straightforward, is just, look, um, if I know something, then that thing's true, right? But if I know something, um, it doesn't mean that the thing that I know is necessarily true, right? The thing can be contingently true, right? Like it, if I know that like this cup has beer in it, right? It doesn't mean that the cup having beer in it is a necessary truth. It's a contingent truth, even though I know it. And it being contingent means that um, it's possible that it's true and it's possible that it's false right it it could have not had beer in it right it, it's not actually necessary that it does so all all that this amounts to is saying that god knows or god can know at least logically speaking future truths that are contingent future contingents it's known known as um so some people might respond by saying well given that um Past is in some sense fixed, right? God's knowledge is is already part of the world, part of the fixed past. Um, uh, when it comes to the time of your action, you can't do otherwise than what He knows that you'll do. So they'll take this to be just a refutation of, of libertarian free will. You don't have alternative possibilities there. Um, given the past and God's knowledge in the past. Well. Uh, let's distinguish between um, two things, right? So on the one hand, we've got, um, so, so here's an example from David Lewis's uh, paper on the paradoxes of time travel, right? He says, um, he's talking about, and, and this, is, I think it's basically the same problem, right? Um, let's say Tim goes back in time um, and hates his Nazi grandfather, 
um, wants to kill him, right? Because his grandfather and plays some part in the war, whatever, kills a load of people, whatever. So Tim spends ages learning how to shoot, buys a rifle, really good rifle, whatever, practices with it for ages, gets in his time machine, goes back in time to before Tim was born, stakes out his grandfather's route to work every day, perfectly clear, still day, it's got him in the sights, there's no one around, blah, blah, blah. Uh, can he kill his grandfather, right? And on the one hand, I mean, he can, right? Because, like, he's got the gun in his hand. He's a good shot. Still day, blah, blah, blah. It seems, like, easy that he could kill his grandfather. And what that's doing is you're saying, keep the proposition that he kills his grandfather is, like, logically consistent with a bunch of facts, right? Which is his skill in the, at, the, at shooting the gun, um, the weather the laws of physics blah 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 it's consistent with that bunch of facts um and that's right on the other hand he can't kill his grandfather because um uh his grandfather doesn't die there right he he carries on living gives birth to tim's dad who gives birth to him blah 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 right so if we in, if, extend the circle of facts that we're taking into account to include the fact that he doesn't kill him then no he can't kill him right like it, it's not possible in that sense um i think lewis uh, says something like look can i speak finnish i mean yes in a way like my larynx is developed in the right way right i you know i have the appropriate like capacity to to learn it and blah 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 but you know don't take me to helsinki with you f as my as your interpreter because like i can't speak finnish Right, like if you include also the facts about what he actually knows, then it, he can't speak it. Right, so whether what we're saying here is, it, it obviously it's true in the sense that like if you include the fact that God knows that you um, are not going to uh, play the guitar or whatever it is, then it's not also you know the, the the proposition God knows you're going to play the guitar and you're not going to play the guitar. If you stick a possibility operator in front of that conjunction, you find that that what you get is something false, right? It's not possible that both of those things. But what you find is that um, if you take it on its own, right? God knows that you're going to play the guitar, and you know, possibility operator, it's possible that you don't play the guitar, right? That conjunction is true, right? So that it's the which things are within the scope of the possibility operator. You just have to make sure that you spell that out clearly. Um, but when you do, uh, you find that actually is the important, the thing that you need is just God's foreknowledge and the possibility of you not doing it. That's all you need to spell out the thing that you need to, to show that there can be future contingents. Um, so yeah, it's, it, again, it's just one of these things where you need to write it down, be careful, spell it out properly, but, but, um, yeah, it's a crystal clear distinction there. And actually, people who, who reason the way that you were doing beforehand are like demonstrably making a... They are actually making a modal scope fallacy. Yeah, I mean, it might be a modal scope fallacy, but it just seems that a lot of people who would endorse like the principle of Turner possibility and stuff like that want to say that like keeping all the facts about the past fixed, like the laws, the initial conditions and stuff like that, that they have free will only if um, uh, they can act otherwise than they do at this moment. Or they could have acted otherwise than they do, keeping all that fixed, right? Um, but if some of those past yeah. facts include God's knowledge about what you're going to do, or and perhaps they're subject to just standard fatalist arguments too, like I think it would be, um, then you can't have done otherwise. Just all the worlds, all of the possible worlds that have that same past, in other words, won't um, have a different action. Um, that yeah. You do at the time. Okay. So uh, to be an alchemist, you have to draw a distinction between hard facts and soft facts, right? right? And the, that distinction is facts that have a trace of futurity about them are, um, uh, which way round is it? I guess hard facts. I can never actually remember which way round it goes. But look, the idea is that you, if we include, so take a trivial example. Forget all the God stuff, right? Like, let's just say um, that if I include all the facts about today, a libertarian wants to say something like this: Look, all of the facts about today are compatible with like the the laws of physics and the position of each particle, blah blah blah. 
all of that stuff, if you collect it together, is compatible equally with me picking A and with me picking B, right? That each of those is logically uh, compatible um, because I'm free or whatever, right? So, I mean, we might say you know, indeterminism or something is a bit like this. The, the state of the quantum state of the universe is compatible with it decaying or not decaying over a given period, something like that. Um, okay, fair enough. But then you might say, well, look, let me include into the facts that are true today uh, future tense truths about tomorrow, right? Like whether the particle actually does decay in the next five minutes, whether it will decay in the next five minutes or not. Right? If I'm allowed to have that, I mean, because after all, that might be true now, right? And if that is one of the presently true facts, one of the ones that's about the future, then, you know, it, over, trivially, there's no um, contingency, right? So, but if you, so if you include these facts that describe the future, then of course, yeah, even any libertarian would have to concede then there's no contingency, right? If, you, if I'm allowed to, like, and that's, that's just what's going on with Tim and his grandfather, right? Once you include the fact that he doesn't kill his grandfather, then it's just logically contradictory to suppose that he can kill his grandfather, right? Because then you've got P and not P. So everyone will concede that that's not possible. Um, but uh, you know, the question is just, well, the alchemist is going to say it's not fair to include facts that have a trace of futurity about them, right? What well, all you're doing then is just like turning it into like a description of something and its negation at the same time. And the interesting thing is supposed to be, um, are there, is there anything about the current state of the world, i.e. things about like how, um, where things are and the laws of physics, blah, 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 that that leaves it all open in some respects, whether I do A or B, then that's what we mean by it being open. Um, and these ideas, when you say, well, look, God knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, that's just like him, like just saying God knows that there's a future tense truth, which is that you will do A. Right? It's exactly the same thing. So an alchemist has to make a distinction between, and I think it's fair enough to make that distinction because it's, you know, they'll just concede with, if what you mean is that you're allowed future tense truths, then of course, right, it's just trivial. But if we take them out, then that's where the interesting question is. And it seems like you, you're not going to be able to show me how it's uh, how how fatalism follows uh, just on those soft facts, right? Anyway, yeah, it, 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 we could talk about that for a long time as well. Right, right. <laughs> um, I had a somewhat unrelated question that I had to ask. Um, are, are you familiar with and do you have an opinion on Newcomb's problem, the one box, two box? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, so I don't have a particular, I mean, I take it that that was more or less settled mathematically, wasn't it? It's, we're talking Monty Hall problem, right? It's the same thing. No, 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 the, uh, oh. I'll just, I'll just state it quickly if it, to, um, so there's, there's two boxes in a room, uh, one is opaque and the other is transparent. Um, the transparent one has a thousand dollars in it, you can see, and the Opaque one either has nothing or a million dollars in it. All right. mm -hmm. You can either pick only the opaque box or the opaque box and the transparent box, so one box or two box. Um, however, you know that there is a like an oracle or a predictor of some sort that oh, predicted yeah. what right, you would right. choose, right? If it predicted yeah. you'd only take the opaque box, it puts a million in there. And if it predicted you'd only, and you take both boxes, it puts nothing in the opaque box. And it's, we suppose it's like 95% reliable. And that you know that it's not that reliable. So do you, do you take only the opaque box or do you take both of them? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I certainly don't know any, uh, any of the literature on that enough to say what the clever things people have said about that are. So I'd just be shooting off my hip. I mean, uh, I guess if you, I mean, off the top of my head, I guess I do. Oh, actually, I don't know what I do off the top of my head. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Uh, no worries. No worries. <laughs> because the, the, the main point is that there are intuitions that pull in different directions, right? On the evidence, right, you think that um, taking the one box will get you more money because people who take one box get a million dollars more or less on average, and the people who take both of them get far less because the predictors are usually accurate um, in their predictions. Um, but on the other hand, you might think, well, there's only some amount of money in the room. I, I can't change that. So Once why not? Why not just take all the money that's on the table? So, and these these sort of intuitions pull in, in, in different directions. Um, yeah, it sort of reminds me of. Um... 
So there are these there's these things called um oh fuck no, how does this go? So um you can think of a machine which um does the it so it makes um oh fuck. I think I've started saying something where I'm not gonna be able to explain it properly. So I'm just going to back out of that before I start yeah, no saying stuff and get further down it and then re realize that I, I can't finish that. Um, maybe I'll come back to it if it pops into my head in a minute. Uh, Timber was wondering if you were talking about the St. Petersburg paradox. No, I don't know that. All right. Uh, I'll just ask another question that uh, we have a few more. Um, Osfox wondered earlier if you think that something like your Thoughtology podcast um, could be more mainstream, like uh, to make uh, philosophy more accessible to, to people. Um, I'm sure it could. Um, and um, that required me doing more, making more of an effort. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I guess I should do something. But, but I mean, I'm not interested in... Um, I like talking to, I like talking about philosophy, and I started it just really so that I could um, talk to some people that were interesting, that I sort of knew a bit that I knew I could call a favor in from. Um, and yeah, I've gone, I've gone in and out of enjoying it. Sometimes I really enjoy it, and sometimes I don't. So I, I don't know. I don't get much. I don't I'm not very good at like interacting with like people um like on platforms and stuff like this type of thing talking to people um I sort of talk to a very small circle of people um so I don't know you know like some people not to name any names but some people are on Facebook or kind of writing fucking stuff to get content and views and um blah 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 I just can't be bothered. Um, so <laughs> if I was more motivated to do that, then maybe I would. But um, yeah, I I don't know. Maybe. maybe. All right. Um, we had a question from uh, Modus Ponens begs the question. It, he was wondering if you had any uh, views on labor theory of value and whether it's unfalsifiable. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not really. <laughs> No worries. Um, and then there's a somewhat technical question from. Wait, you 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 do have a view on that because we discussed. I don't have a settled view anyway. I mean, we talked about it, sure, um, but it, I wouldn't I wouldn't even describe that much as a view. I mean, I was thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so a bit of a technical question from Sepp Tuplet. Um, so he's, he's wondering what's your take on quantifying in with respect to modal and propositional attitude and context. Um, so it says, particularly with extensional solutions uh, to propose, such, to such proposed by figures like David Lewis, uh, counterpart theory. Not exactly sure what he's asking, but <laughs> that, was, that was the question. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I'm quite familiar with David Lewis's counterpart theory, and I think what he's asking about is, uh, I'm not entirely sure what the problem with quantifying in and David Lewis's counterpart theory is supposed to be. It sounds to me more like um, the problem of like quantifying in and modal context and stuff sounds more like Quine to me, um, and I'm not seeing the direct connection between those two maybe i'm not seeing something really obvious but uh because of that i'm not quite sure what the question is so i'm quite sure how to answer it yeah no worries uh yeah that was if he's still here you can maybe um you, you could ask it on vc there uh, yeah. he's in chat if you want to you can ask him Alex yourself if you want to clarify well, yeah you know either modal or propositional context is choice, but I'm just going to type out here one of Quine's examples from his Quantifiers and Propositional Attitudes article. Where am I looking in? 
can we can in the VC text, text. Just right about the text. Uh, okay. the yeah, so he gives example uh, seven. This is the um, the seven is the quantifying in example, and eight is is not. And so, yeah, he says like in everyday circumstances, the seven would be false and eight would be true. Like in a, an intelligence counterintelligence circumstance, um, it's possible, you know, that they both could be true. Sounds like. They read, they or something. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I was, seven I was says, <laughs> let's just be clear about this. So, seven to yeah. says there's some X that such that Ralph believes that X is a spy. So, if X, if Ralph um, believes that some particular person over there in the room looking dodgy is a spy, yeah. then seven would be true, right? Eight, on the oh, other hand, yeah. is just to say um, that he thinks that spies exist, right? That there are spy right. agencies in general, and he thinks they have employees. In you know, right. so it's much more general. Much um, more. So seven is you have a specific person, specific thing in mind that you think that of that thing, it's a spy. The other one just says there are spies. Yeah, but in and the... that's what he believes. Yeah, right. In okay, so. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the in the relational predicate of belief, um, the second uh, relata would be like a, a statement or some kind of term representation of a statement, uh, just kind of like an eight. So if if that's so, um, in seven, shouldn't we have like X is a spy in um, quote? Uh, quotation marks are in some way to uh, indicate that this is a term representation of the statement X is spy? Um, okay, so it, I mean, it feels like you can do that if you want to, and then what you're saying is um, so you could could you not just say, okay, a rewrite of seven is there's some X such that Ralph's belie Ralph believes that open quotes x is a spy close quotes is true um right. and feels like that i don't see much of a difference between that and what we put in seven in the first place i think quine thinks there's a big difference there um uh but and quine, quine is super smart hmm. but um what if we i'm just not cut sure out... many people think that that really matters that much right what if we just cut out that rather than uh, quote unquote, X is a spy, end quote, mm -hmm. is true. We could just put Ralph believes, quote, X is a spy, quote. I mean, we can adopt these the very regimented conventions of how to write this thing down. I'm, yeah. I'm not following what the problem is supposed to be, though. Let's well, say we I'm, do I'm not, what, I'm we not suggesting that there is any kind of problem. I was just getting some thoughts. That's all. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, I think that not much changes if we do that. It feels to me like um, um, task is true, true schema. So like um, snow is white, if and only if, you know, quote, snow is white is true. No, uh, it's basically the same thing, right? They're basically the same, like exactly the same thing, but most of the time they're basically the Alex, same. I, I also wanted to, uh, I also wanted to ask a question. This might be slightly unrelated, but I don't, I don't mm -hmm. want to miss this. Do you believe that the Christian Trinity is uh, necessarily a contradiction or incoherent? Um. Well, I think. It seems incoherent to me whether it's literally inconsistent. I don't know. It's hard to say uh, because I, I just don't understand the combination okay. of words. So, so you, don't, you don't really understand it? So. That's right, yeah. So, it seems incoherent, but you're not making a claim that it is. I'm not making the claim that it's inconsistent, okay. as in I can derive a... I mean, there are, there are plenty of ways that you can seemingly derive a contradiction, but whether... I mean, if I said something like, you know, it violates the transitivity of identity or something, right? This is a well-known way of seeming to show that it uh, um, that that it that it does that. Um, 
that you could probably pull out one of the like 50 million ways where people say that it doesn't because of whatever personhood and essence and blah 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 and i'd be lost again thinking well what are we talking about i don't know what we, i don't know what any of that means either so right. at the end of the day I, I just don't know what to say about it and what like about crazy, the, uh, the hypostatic union what about the idea that jesus is fully divine and fully man do you think that's a contradiction that he's fully divine and fully man i mean Look, if I said something is uh, red all over and green all over, I mean, I understand that that can't happen, but I also don't think there's a strictly speaking logical contradiction with saying that. Um, so I don't know if I could do any better with what you just said there. I mean, I'm, I'm just not really sure what it means to be fully man <laughs> and fully divine. I don't really know what that means, but like, if I can't derive a formal logical contradiction from saying something's red all over and green all over, I probably won't do any better with what you're talking about. I also want to ask, do you assert that uh, disembodied minds cannot exist? No. So, you're not, so you don't personally believe that Christianity, there is any contradiction or inconsistency in Christianity? There, there isn't anything, right, that you would point out to be? I mean, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I might do, um, <laughs> but look, when it comes to something like that, I, you know, there are there are things you can say apart from simply just saying, "Do you think this proposition is logically uh, inconsistent or whatever?" Like, I it might you, not, but that's just one end of the. I understand. Wait that a second, you, if, if you don't mind. Sorry, just let me finish saying what I'm saying. You're asking me if one very extreme end of um, a kind of scale of refutation has been met and just because i don't think that it goes quite that far doesn't mean uh, as you seem to Im indicate from what you said then that i said so you don't have anything to say about it and i just you know it, it feels to me like you're the way that you're approaching this is lacking the required level of nuance and no, um, no. subtlety See, to right. capture what my right. view is right alex i respect the fact that you don't believe that christianity is true for it doesn't even show to be true. But I was wondering if you also believe it could not be true. And I find out that you don't believe that there is anything that would make it you know, possible to be true. Because a logical contradiction cannot be true as well. Okay, you you broke up quite a lot there, but I uh so I'm not quite sure I, I got what you were saying, but um but I'm I I'm almost certainly not saying the the things you seem to be um is it, I'm not sure whether it's that you're you want me to say them or that you don't want me to say them. It seems, there seems to be um, an agenda almost in the, in the question. Um, and I think that it's, you you want a different sparring partner from me, um, right? I, I'm going to say, I'm going to probably do something that you think of as weaseling out of the questions you're trying to ask me um, because they seem to, um, uh, lacking in nuance to give a, an answer that faithfully reflects my view on on the issues that you're bringing up. Uh, was there any more comments on that Canadian, or was that it? Oh, by the way, Alex Malapas, thanks for uh, thanks for your thoughts. Uh, no trouble. All right. Um, if anyone had any. Uh, for the questions they wanted to ask in, in chat. Uh... Yeah, probably the last couple, because I'm I'm going to go to bed in a minute. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks again for doing this. Um, uh, Chad had a, had a question. Um, yes, does being well-versed in philosophy and, and being technically minded um, make it harder to talk to the average person or make uh, general conversation more difficult? Um. <laughs> um no i think it makes uh let's see i think it makes sometimes it makes talking about so it can right it can if you get um like there's a sort of philosophical mode of conversing about things which is like ultra critical and ultra analytic or whatever and applying that outside 
certain types of context is obviously inappropriate, right? Like casual conversation with friends and whatnot, you know, sitting around playing poker with my buddies, I'm not going to be as ultra analytical as I would be in a conversation like this. And I do both of those types of things, right? So it's not like I can't operate outside of the philosophy environment, right? Um, so it can do if if you um, if if you apply that the wrong way. I mean, it's tempting sometimes to do that if somebody starts making an argument outside of this type of context, and they're obviously saying something fallacious, and it's difficult to just not stop start going. But hold on, if modus ponens, blah blah blah, and quantify that, and blah blah blah, and you can be a dick right by by talking like that in the wrong environment. Um, I, I like to think that I don't do that. Um, on the other hand, I sort of think that there's a certain level of benefit that it can have from being precise in other non-philosophical contexts, you know, generic work environments, for instance, where expressing yourself clearly um, in a meeting or in a uh, when writing a document or plan or an email or something, being able to clearly state a position and explain the nuance and uh, um, articulate what is effectively an argument uh, clearly can have massive benefits and um you know doing that certainly helped me uh numerous times outside the philosophy world so so sometimes it, it actually pays off um it, you know you just have to withhold in the tendency to be a patronizing dickhead and if you can manage to do that then philosophy can be quite helpful <laughs> Um, and a more, we had a question from Alien who asked uh, if you favor quantificationalism, Minongianism, or some other way of, of making ontological commitments. Um, getting any views on? Um, not really. I'm not a big fan of Minongianism, so if that helps. Um, right. Um, I'm a big fan of Russell's critique of Minong, even if it is a bit superficial. I, I like I like Russell's paper on denoting where he gives the the boot to Minong. Um, I wrote my master's thesis on that. Um, my master's thesis was called "On On Denoting," which I thought was <laughs> hilarious at the time. Um, but yeah, I don't have much more to say about that. I don't think. All right, and uh, Frank Dunleavy was wondering if you had any views on relative identity or on identity in general? Um, um, well, I mean, so relative identity is um, an idea that was first brought in by, um, oh, geez, who was that guy that brought it in? The guy at Oxford in the 60s. Oh, what the fuck was his name? Oh, well. I want to say Grice, but that's not right. Um, did Gilbert Ryle? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> hmm. Oh, well, it's a factoid that's dropped out of my brain. Um, but I guess I think I think that those examples of his um, are, are somewhat superficial. And it seems to me that most of the time, um so for instance let's say um so i think where i'm more where i have more of a solid idea is well if you think about things like identity over time or identity across possible worlds or something um i think actually that i'm more inclined to say something like oh, i think you think um, of geech i think you think of geech yeah geech. that's right peter yeah. geech that's yeah. it exactly um Right, that, I think that's why my mind went to Grice in the first place. Yeah. Um, so Peter Geech was the guy who first came up with possible worlds um, in a letter to Arthur Pryor, where he suggested thinking about um, the accessibility relation in terms of uh, teleporters that somebody jumps into. And if the teleporters could only take you to certain worlds, that would be a way of modeling um, the relations in um, different systems of modal logic, which is quite cool. So like sci-fi. Um, and the idea of teleporters uh, was where we get like modern possible worlds theory from in the first place. Anyway, um, yes, yeah, so I look, this is quite a long story short. I, I kind of feel like the examples uh, that Geech uses 
sound like it's changing topic, right? And it's not really identity anymore. And the identity really just is one thing and it's perfectly precise and it's almost trivial and nothing's identical to anything that's that's not that it that's in any way different from it, right? Um, yeah, right, right, right. Everything is identical to itself and nothing else, right? And what that means is that even you, I think you probably have a view that ends up being a bit like Ted Siders, where you've got not only ident identity, a trans world identity is uh, there's no trans world identity, strictly speaking, but there's also no trans temporal identity either. It's just for time slices. Um, and what you've got is relations between those things of similarity and then strictly speaking not identity but then what you can do is you can say well um it's kind of identity let's call it schmidentity and then you've got loads of interesting looking schmidentity relations and that relative identity um that Geech talks about is one in one of those family of schmidentity relations but strictly speaking strict identity is just like doesn't admit of degrees not relative it's all just uh one one thing that's not very interesting um yeah okay so i think i'm on that unless there's any anything else in particular that's really pressing but i think i'm probably gonna have to go um, yeah that's that's perfectly good um well, thank you again for yeah spending uh run run away, run, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> run away Alex. <laughs> i mean we can talk about the the labor theory of value if you like now? that would probably be too much of a conversation for now <laughs> I was going to see if Jack started talking about it, and then I would just hang up and just see if, how long it took for anyone to think to. And this is a person who thinks he doesn't need anger management class. <laughs> it's only when you're on the line. Now. I was fine up until you <laughs> kept popping up. We got snide comments. Anyway. Yeah, so, uh, of course, you're always uh, welcome back in the server. And Cool. Um, uh, thanks very much. Yeah, no trouble. Thanks but very much. Tone down the anti-Catholic rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> I will try and work on that. Thanks for the thanks for the information, Jack. That's been really super useful. <laughs> <laughs> no, All right, see you later. <laughs>